So today I'm going to spend time talking a little bit about how you can actually apply machine learning. But before I get into that, just shortly telling you who I am and why you should listen to me. My background is also within special effects in movies. So I tend to see movies and TV shows as an artistic media, not just see it as data. So I have both sides of it, I usually say. I see it both from the data perspective, but also the, uh, the artistic uh, perspective. As you can see here, this is my first VHS collection that fairly fast grew into a huge DVD collection that right now is basically just being there gathering dust because the whole industry is moving into the digital. Now, what we at Viron Labs trying to prove here is to see if we can actually understand how a director is communicating emotions through imagery and sound. So the big question is, can we move beyond genres? Can we move beyond those traditional ways of working with content that we've been doing for the past 20 years? I think all of us have worked with metadata. And with metadata, I mean everything from genres to the actor to keywords. As you see here in front of you, you have the typical type of metadata that you have from like IMDb, Grace Note, and Rovi, where you have keywords for the movie Passenger, for example, that have space station, space, swimming pool, crying woman, crying man, and argument. These keywords are not setting any context to what we are watching. These keywords are actually making it more difficult for us to understand the context and uh, what kind of emotions the director is trying to communicate. And then we have new technologies coming up, like image recognition from Google, uh, Facebook, and Amazon. But these type of technologies can't really enrich our data either. They can give us some more data, but they wouldn't give us that much. Now, what we're trying to do is try to actually capture what type of emotion is the director trying to communicate through this. So if we look, have everybody seen the TV show Defenders here from Netflix? It's a great show. The, this type of show uh, is a little bit complicated to get a new audience in because what they did is that they merged four TV shows at the same time into one big show. So there's only 1% of the audience at Netflix that actually watch all four TV shows, which is Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist, and then watch the TV show Defenders with all those four characters. So which means that it's going to be a little bit hard for the audience to follow the storyline. So what the directors did here, they used the colors in the movie and the color setting they did to actually help us understand the story and also affect our emotions. You can see that the character Daredevil always have the color red wherever he goes. You can see Jessica Jones have this cold blue color. Then we have Luke Cage and Iron Fist that has yellow and green colors. Now, look at this. This is really interesting. This is season one, first time Daredevil meets uh, Jessica Jones. He's in the police station. You can see that the whole scene is blue. Behind him, you see this red door symbolizing that he's just visiting in Jessica Jones's universe. We're not right now in Daredevil's universe. So with the help of colors, the director is helping us to actually understand the story. So have you guys seen the movie Dunkirk? This is really, really interesting. How Christopher Nolan got us to actually feel the stress the soldiers felt on the uh, beach of Dunkirk. He used the music and the soundtrack to make us feel the stress feeling those soldiers had that day that was horrible. I will play you now a little bit of that soundtrack and I will explain a little bit as I'm playing it how he did it. This is called the Shepherd Stone. The shepherd stone is a trick that they use to make us feel an ever-increasing pace that stresses us. This is when the high octave and the low octave is actually fading in and out, synchronized with each other, making it sound like it's constantly raising in stress levels. And this helped us to actually feel that stress as we watch this movie. Now, what we do now at Vion Labs is that we actually measure this type of data points to be able to utilize it and automate the whole process. What you're looking at in front of here is two fingerprints for two movies. It's two James Bond movies from Russia with Love and Spectra. Each of these tiles actually moving up and down is a scene from the movie. How fast it moves up and down shows the amount of action in that scene. How wide it is shows how long the scene is and then we see each color within each scene. Now, what we can see here is that the first movie, it's a little bit uh, slower than the other one, as you can see. 
you can see that it's way slower. It builds up for momentum basically by the end of the movie. The new James Bond movie starts off with a hardcore action scene, with a parkour scene where they're running on the roofs, they blow everything up, then you go have five minutes of storyline and talk, and then they start doing a more action scene. It's constantly action through the whole movie. This is typically what I joke about and call a Michael Bay certified movie. He loves explosions. He loves this type of movies. So, why is this important? Because we want to be able to understand what is the emotion that the director is trying to communicate. Have everybody seen the movie Top Gun? Mm -hmm. Good, we work with content. The reason I chose the movie Top Gun here is because a little bit older movie, and what you can see in front of you here, and this is the first time in the movie and TV industry we can actually see emotions in the data. What we see here in front of you is a, a VAD analysis that we do on the audio, which means that we capture and predict the emotions that humans would perceive as they watch this movie. Now, we all remember Tom Cruise's best friend, Goose. As Goose dies in this movie, we can see a huge dip in negativity in the data. And we can see the stress levels hitting the roof. This is really, really interesting because we have never been able to measure this type of emotions in our uh, movies and TV series. Then we see the final fight of the movie in Top Gun. You can see this huge red dip coming down with the stress levels hit the roof, showing that's a very, very stressful scene that is very, very negative there. But it's really interesting. It ends actually with a very happy, as you can see, it ends very happily. You they fly out in the sunset and we can see that it's, it, it, it's, it's ending happily. And this has not been possible before. Now, the question is, how do we utilize this? Because all of this sounds very interesting, but how do we apply this to enhance the user experience already today in a scalable way? Well, first of all, if we look at only the audio, only, only the audio of a movie, and do this type of analysis that I showed you, and in this case, what we did with an analysis on 3,000 movies, Follow me now, because this is really game-changing. 3,000 movies, and out of those 3,000 movies, by just doing emotional analysis on the audio, we were able to cluster together all the superhero ac action-adventure movies, like Marvel movies. We had Avengers 1, 2, and 3 positioned as the most similar emotionally movies together out of 3,000 movies and we didn't know anything about the movies. We didn't have the metadata, which means that we didn't know the titles, we didn't know the director, we didn't know the genre. We had no clue what these titles were. But the computer were able to find the similarities between them only based on how humans would emotionally perceive the audio. Then we had movies like Need for Speed and Fast and the Furious and a lot of action and cars in them. They were also clustered together in a cluster and remember, this is a computer doing all the job by us teaching the computer how we perceive movies emotionally. Now, to utilize this, to make the user experience better, we're going to start off with showing just a little bit of something that I hope most of you recognize, the typical field where you have something that is similar to something. So you click a movie like the movie Martian, and you want to see other similar movies like that. The typical way to do it is collaborating filtering. For you, that, uh, people that don't know what collaborating filtering is, is a typical way of what Amazon did. People who bought this also bought this. Somebody have a kid that influenced my flow, that uh, using the, my friend's uh, pr uh, service, for example, that gives me, as you can see, not so very similar movies to the movie Martian. Then a more traditional way to do it is using the genres, the actors, and directors to find similarities between content. And as you can see, it becomes a little bit better result, but it doesn't capture the emotions of the movie Martian. What happens when we add this type of data that I talk about? You can truly feel the essence. You can see the results here become way more emotionally close to the movie Martian. The movie Arrival and Martian are not both played out on Mars, but they're both talking in the same way emotionally to us. They're slower sci-fi, they're telling a very complex story. And now we can actually capture this essence. We have never been able to do that before up until today and with the technology that is available today. Now, the first field that all of us recognize, like I mentioned, is when you actually click a movie and you have this field called similar movies. People tend to underestimate this. Why? Because this is the foundation of the rest of the service if you want to create a good personalization and recommendations. 
Why? Because if you want to base something on what I have watched, you have to understand what I watched and the context of it. So you can actually create a personalized start page by telling me, because I watched Martian, I should watch this type of movies. And of course, this should be timed after the time of the day and the device that I'm actually using. Now, another thing we can do is we can use the same data point to actually give out notifications that tells us what is new in the service that fits the same type of similar movies that I just watched and I uh, tend to watch. Now, there's a specific place in a service where we always use the, uh, lose the users. That is when the end credits of a movie starts. Because when the end credits of a movie starts, the user have to go back to the start page and do another choice, especially in on-demand services today, right? Now, if we're able actually to use our data to identify when the end credit starts and give the users recommendations as they start, we can actually capture them before they leave. When with Netflix's own numbers here, we can see that 75% of the viewers stays in the service when they get recommendations by the end credit, and 90% of them going back to the start page leaves the service. I mean, that is the difference between day and night. That is a huge difference with a little, little improvement in the user experience. So to be able to dis do this type of stuff, we need to set a good data foundation. We cannot just build it on genres that is from the 1940s. You can have comedies that go all the way from Woody Allen to Jim Carrey. They're emotionally very different from each other. Another way we can lose the users is when they usually do a search for content we don't have. For example, Game of Thrones or Avengers Infinity War that have not been released yet. This is also a typical uh, place where the re user hits a dead end. Now, if we can give them similar content to what they're actually searching for, we can capture them instead of just giving them a no result as they do a search for content that they couldn't find. So these are all small improvements that raises the engagement between 5 to 10% as we improve our services using this type of data. Now, if we set a good foundation from the start, we're not just able to create a good discovery and a personalized service. We can do some really extraordinary things. And today, I will show you guys a world exclusive. I will show you the world's first AI-generated movie trailer. And with this, I mean with artificial intelligence, we had it used to create a trailer or promotional material that I think most of you can recognize when you look at Netflix. As you hover above a poster, a trailer starts over here to give you a sense of what you're watching. So remember now, no humans have had any to do, anything to do here. There's no manual work at all. This is a fully a computer that decides what music to add to this uh, trailer and how to cut it together. So I'm going to start this trailer. Now, can you believe a computer did that? A computer truly picked up the essence of a movie, Life of Pi, and created this type of trailer and promotion material. Now, to do this on a scalable way for, say, 50,000 movies at once, to be able to actually create a better user experience like this, is, a, as I see it for the future, the difference between actually succeeding and not succeeding. So to investing in our data, in our consumers, in our viewers, is going to be ex extremely important. That's all I had for today. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes. Any questions? It's pretty cool stuff. A shy audience? <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so 
What emotions do you actually measure? What type? Just the uh, basic ones, Ang anger, happiness, and so on, or is it more specified? We will follow a typical model called valence, uh, arousal, and dominance uh, that we measure for example, positive and negative emotions, stress levels in the content, and from there on, like I showed you how the movie Tom, uh, Top Gun ends happily. That's a, f I mean, type of tag you could basically create by looking into the data to see when it goes like that, that you can actually create a tag saying that the movie ends happily, for example. So there's a lot of ways to work and tag up type of emotions, but using the VAD analysis that we do, it's actually the best way to create uh, similarities between content like recommendations. Hi, very interesting. You mentioned that the, the emotional data that you're gathering is based on audio. Mm. Obviously, our emotions as humans are also based on sight as well. Mm. So are you also analyzing the different, um, you know, the movie, the sight of what we see and how that changes as emotions as opposed to only the audio piece? That's a great question. You actually saved me because I missed out to point that out on my presentation, is that I just pointed out the audio analysis to show the power behind the engine, which means that we didn't even use the imagery what I showed you, for example, with the superhero movies and the uh, Need for Speed movies, uh, Fast and Furious movies. So yeah, we use stuff like the colors, the action level of the content that I showed you in the fingerprint to be able to create the much deeper analysis of the content. And as I showed you with the Top Gun, I mean, it basically predicts how the audience would perceive the content. So it gives you a glimpse into the future to actually see how content would make basically perform. Did I answer your question? Good. Um, how do you prevent the, the trailer from showing any key plot developments that you don't want spoiled for the audience before they watch it? Someone dying or something like that? Without giving away too much of our secrets, I mean, I can take a simple example for you. Without, uh, we don't give away spoilers by the end of the movie. So a simple way there is just to remove the last 20% of a movie, making sure you just use the first hour of the movie when you do clips. But we have, you, as you see, emotional data, the positive and negative emotions. We can see huge dips, as you saw in the Top Gun movie, that we can actually utilize to see what we should use and not to use. So there's a big thinking behind that because spoilers are inc incredibly important as I see it. That's why I personally don't like longer trailers. They give away usually way too much of the content. Um, do you think this technology is purely automatic? You would trust it or do you plan in the long term also to have always human verification on the results? I usually say that we can't fully always let our machines do everything, especially when we talk about creative medium, like, like uh, artistic medium as movies. That's why I call my presentation Mathematic and Arts, because this is actually an art form. So having humans involved and teaching the machines is important, and the humans are the ones that are actually giving the machines the input. But yeah, this is a fully automated process that I actually trust with my life on. This is what I believe is going to be the future, especially when we work with the content libraries growing so fast. Looking at an operator today, they have maybe around 50,000 titles published on their service weekly into uh, network DVR and whatever kind of recording services they could have and so on. But when it comes to SVOD, SVOD services, they're maybe three, 4,000 titles today, and it's growing up to 10,000 titles. So to be able to do this on scalable ways, extremely important and fully automized. Uh, we're a very, very small team, and we will always be a small team because we tend to focus on letting the machines do the work, but the humans being there to actually teach the machines how to do the work. Did I answer your question well? Thanks. Arash, that was brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you, Arash. Thank you.